Now, I understand that what I'm saying is a pretty bold statement. Is the death poker really the best weapon in the game, you filthy casual? First of all, that's kind of mean. Second of all, check this out. So yeah, I would feel inclined to say so. But let me give you my qualifications first. I've played through Elden Ring numerous times. I lost count, actually, breaking every single wrist on Godric to killing Melania without healing once. I've used so many weapons, so many different builds, scripted bosses time and time again, and yet, the Death Poker was by far the easiest time I've had with this game. So what I'm going to do is guide you through my setup and each boss that I faced, essentially doing a walkthrough proving how easy it was. This is technically also a continuation of our series where I test certain weapons on a playthrough to see how good it is, and I don't mean to spoil the ending here, but this weapon is an easy 11 out of 10. I had to play through the game twice to make sure I wasn't dreaming, so I'll be showing you clips from both of my playthroughs on my journey. By all means, if you think there's a better weapon out there, don't hesitate to let me know and bring shame upon my name. But without further ado, my name is Josh, also known as Gh, and I hope you enjoy the Death Poker run slash walkthrough, or whatever I'm gonna call this video. Let's begin the game by creating Sister Freed from Dark Souls 3 because, well, she's hot. And I gave her an equally hot name, Piss Nuts. The Samurai class was my choice because of the longbow. It just saves a bit of time because I need it for the Death Bird. The Death Poker can be obtained by beating this Death Right Bird in Kaelid, who to this day are still some of my least favorite mini bosses. Fortunately, we have the high ground. Now you can go about this in a couple of ways, but I went with the Holy Pots as they deal insane damage and a longbow at plus two to finish off the remaining health. As long as you stick up here, he won't really do too much, but be wary of the flame trails as they can sneak their way up into your safe spot. With our main weapon in hand, let's go upgrade it. EG provides somber stones one through four. Here in Altus Plateau, this scarab gives us number five. And the sixth one I usually grab from the Falling Star Beast Jr. in Celia Crystal Tunnel. So I prepared for this fight by killing the Mother Dragon and gathering the main buffs for the run. The Ash of War Golden Vow can be applied to my starting weapon, giving us a nice 11.5% boost in attack. The Wondrous Physic I mixed with the Intelligence Knot and Magic Shrouding Tear, boosting our intelligence by 10 and magic damage by 20% for 3 minutes. Which you're gonna find out very shortly, 3 minutes is a very long time. Lastly, I grab the Warrior Jar Shard to further increase the Ash of War by 10%. Alright, let's see how much damage this does. Oh! That's quite a bit! Oh! Alright! With the 6th stone in hand, I travel to Volcano Manor to grab the 7th. This one is a bit tricky because you have to fight the Godskin Noble. I, I know there's like a skip to do it. I'm terrible at it, so I had to fight him. But it's pretty easy. Just hide behind a pillar, leave a trail, you'll be fine. Number 8 and 9 are really easy to find. They're in Upper Kaelid, no hurdles to jump over required. So we now have a plus 9 weapon on our hands. Our first victim is none other than Mar Get Good, and for this fight, you want to wait for one of two attacks. On my first playthrough, I waited for the long wind-up swing, simply strafing to the right, leaving a trail behind. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And that's the fight. <laughs> that's it. I know he's the first boss, but it's crazy that one Ash of War kills him. I, I, it's astounding to me. On my second playthrough, I waited for the jumping attack, which is much safer than the wind-up, but since this fight ends in one attack, it really doesn't matter. I'm not going for a no-hit run, but because this weapon is so powerful, I didn't get hit by a majority of these bosses anyway. With an extra talisman pouch, I used the Ritual Sword Talisman on my first playthrough, but I did grab the Red Feathered Branch Sword for the second one later, just to see if there were any major changes. Godric is perhaps the easiest fight on this run, what a shocker, because you can counter so many of his attacks without so much as worrying. Simply put, you just dodge his opening and leave a trail. The frostbite will proc, staggering him, and the initial explosion that leaves the trail will have him initiate the second phase. However, you do so much damage that Godric won't be fondling any dragons this time around. Oh yeah, and let me clarify, what you just saw was the sloppy version. On my second playthrough, things went much better. Oh, oh yeah, yep, yep, that gets me really hard. Now you might be wondering, 
Josh, you're using a plus 9 weapon and a lot of buffs against Godric, of course it's going to be broken. And I would agree, however that's not what I'm basing this claim on. Rather, I'm basing this claim on the death poker being the best weapon on how my similar runs went. So just to clarify, I've had experience playing the game in this exact format. Anyways, this is where I branched off in my two playthroughs. On my first run, I fought Ranala, and on my second run, I fought Radon to avoid the academy altogether. And you're gonna see exactly why. Ranala doesn't have a scripted fight because she resists magic and toe sucking more than any other boss, which is where most of my damage comes from. I mean, even then, my damage is still undeniably strong, but the second phase is too unpredictable with her summons, hyper armor upon summoning, and magic spells. Now on my second attempt, she actually gave me really good RNG, preventing her spirit animals from invading the battlefield and dying in mere moments like she deserves. Honestly, Renala kinda strikes me as a Zodiac girl. She's probably out here judging people based on Zodiac signs. I don't really believe in that stuff. My judgment is based on what character you pick to race in Mario Kart, so yeah. Star Scourge Radon, while incredibly frail, is a bit tricky too. See, the trail does the most damage, obviously, but with his combo attacks or awkward angles, on my behalf, they can sometimes miss. In the grand scheme of things, though, it really doesn't matter. You want to follow the acronym, though, STTC, stick to the crotch. If your trail does miss, go right back into his crotch, stuff your face in his ball sack, and simply leave another trail. That one will surely hit as he's recovering from whatever attack he just performed. From there, strafe behind him as he powers up and leave another trail, boom, the fight's done. I have to admit though, on my second playthrough, Radon was a bit of a chode monkey. How are you still targeted on me? <laughs> ah! uh, but anyways, we have uh, a third talisman pouch now, and I used this one for the magic scorpion charm, increasing our magic damage even more by 12%. I'm going to use the 10 seconds that it takes to kill the gigantic tree sentinel to say that 90% of you are not subscribed. I know that everyone does this, but I have to say it. If you do enjoy this type of content, consider joining us for more stupid Elden Ring videos, as well as other gaming content in the form of essays, challenges, or anything I feel like making. That was probably longer than 10 seconds, but I just wanted to let you know. So Godfrey's Shadow Clone requires a different strategy from the rest. The Ash of War, if you trigger it from a distance, makes Godfrey very angry, so he rushes in and stomps. All we have to do is run far enough where his stomps don't reach us, but our flames do. You just repeat this a couple of times and that's that's the fight. It's kind of boring, but don't worry, Godfrey himself is more interesting. Now that we have a fourth talisman pouch, you might be thinking, oh, well, wh what are we going to put in here? Nothing. There's no other talismans that can help out with the Ash of War, so I used nothing. I mean, I put Radagon's Source Seal in there for decoration, but my damage is exactly the same without it. Anyways, as per usual, Morgoth gets absolutely calculated by my swollen brain. I do have around 50 intelligence at this point. So what you want to do is wait for the jumping attack. He'll throw a couple of daggers or spears. Sometimes he'll just be a prick and pimp walk instead of, you know, doing anything. Actually, I actually had to rebuff myself with Golden Vow twice because he just didn't do what I wanted. But once he jumps, roll underneath him, leave two trails, and then just, just wait a second. Alright, just one more trail should do it. Okay, 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 okay. Alright, 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 alright. <laughs> I figured this out on my second playthrough. The first one was almost as smooth, but I didn't have the red feathered branch sword, which mattered a lot in this case. Now it was time to face the fire giant. This one's kind of hard to pull off, but if I can do it, I'm sure you guys can too. What you want to do is get in a couple of heavy jumping attacks to build posture damage. If you don't remember, the Death Poker is a great sword, so its posture damage is not that bad. Even though the Ash of War hasn't broken anyone's stance yet, probably because we kill them before that can even happen, the Fire Giant has enough health where we can use this to our advantage. Once I connected two attacks, all that was left was to leave two trails, and then the second phase will initiate. I still have a rough time knowing exactly where his hand will fall. I got crushed by it a couple of times, so now I have PTSD. But I did get close enough to leave another trail, and boom, that explosion will stagger him. Now all that's left to do is jam your poker into his eyeball and he will die, much like most people in real life. A very easy fire giant kill if I say so myself. And I do. Ah, the foreskin duo once again. Let's get this over with, shall we? My first run, I uh, really don't want to talk about it. <laughs> it was it was very sloppy, and I was resilient and not using any sleep against these guys, but forget it. 
I'm not the Pope trying to uphold something, so let's use some sleep. All right, hopefully this reaches him. Oh, it did. I'm actually very surprised. All right. And goodbye. <laughs> oh my goodness, dude. This weapon is so good. All right, fat boy, it's your turn. Just let me replenish my FP real quick. <laughs> Wait, can I actually kill them? Come on! Wow! I one-cycled them. That's crazy. I've never done that before. Sick, dude. Awesome. Yeah, it was pretty awesome to destroy the Foreskin Brothers. Uh, moving on, we have Malekith, which I realized too late that there's perhaps a better strategy for this fight. What I did was do the initial input, but no follow-up. Now, what happened next was a bit strange. All right. What? What was what 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 was that? I I have no idea what happened there. I, if anyone can explain that, it would be appreciated. Anyways, my second playthrough was much smoother. For the second phase, walk forward just a little bit, leave a trail, and just wait for another opportunity. Two Ashes of War will easily overcome his second health bar. Or I guess the second phase. Yeah! Gideon. Yes! Yeah, he boy. was here. Godfrey starts out much like his Shadow Clone, but you, you can leave a trail from afar if you want to, or wait for his axe throw and put a trail down there. But the kick here is once he starts to buff, you do so much damage that one Ghost Flame trail will trigger the second phase. Second phase, what I like to do, is do the weapon art, no follow-up, roll forward, do the same thing, and most likely, that'll trigger his buff once again, and that's the fight. By the way, keep it in perspective that at this point, my weapon should be at around plus 10. So it's not like I'm overpowered here. And I'm only applying two buffs before a fight. The Wondrous Physic and the Golden Out. Uh, it's not like I'm stacking 80 buffs at the same time. Like, no, obviously then it would be trivial. The final boss is upon us, and like every other boss in this game, there's a script memorized for this fight as well. Radagon always does his pimp walk, allowing for an easy Ash of War. This triggers his jumping slam, simply do another weapon art without the follow-up. That triggers his triple slam, and from there you strafe, get in a couple of hits, and then leave another trail or explosion if you want to, like I did on my second playthrough. It's gonna kill him either way. Now the Elden Beast, I honestly have no idea what happened, but I had the best RNG with this fight. Maybe I did so much damage that his AI bugged because he did no rings, no Elden Stars, nothing. He just kept on trying to melee me, which of course, I left trails everywhere, killing him the fastest I've ever done. I was very shocked, but very pleased with the outcome. Now, as you guys know, there are a couple of optional bosses that I like to fight before we end the run, starting with Dragonlord Flacidusex. If I was a bit smarter, I would have definitely killed him before the second phase, but I goofed a little bit, and he had like a sliver of health left. This is where my big brain comes into play. With his transition, he likes to teleport around and catch the player off guard. That's his opener, pretty much. But if you back up just a little bit, you're safe. I kept just out of range, left a ghost flame trail, and that was it. Mog was next, and as you saw in the intro, this fight was nasty. Hello, this is Josh from the future to let you know that I didn't include it in my intro, so I apologize for the very minor mishap that you probably didn't even notice, and I'm taking up too much of your time. But anyways, I, I love you. Alright, you pedophile. Get ready. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, a little blittering's not gonna hurt me, buddy. Uh-huh. Oh! Oh, I didn't die. Wow, I didn't die from that. <laughs> Melania, you might wonder how the trails would do here. Sometimes I would leave them if the opportunity presented itself, but the explosion was actually much more suitable for this fight. Each explosion actually knocks Melania to the ground, and by staying aggressive, I was able to overpower her quite easily. And even then, my damage was insane. The second phase, I got pretty lucky because after a few jumping attacks, I staggered her, got a critical hit, and with one last explosion, all she did was bloom another flower. By far the easiest Melania fight I've ever had. And that was the run, folks. I hope I put up a convincing argument, but again, if you think that there's something better out there, by all means, let me know. So here's what I love about this weapon. The Death Poker can script fights better than any other weapon. And, and what I mean by that 
is you can easily get away with countering attacks that normally you wouldn't be able to do. For example, Godfrey's buff in his first or second phase. Usually with a weapon art this long, you're going to get hit. The death poker, however, deals so much damage that Godfrey will either enter second phase, or if he's already in the second phase, downright kill him before anything occurs. Mog himself can't even do his ritual, which normally he takes like a fraction of the damage. Funny enough, I probably could have made this weapon even more powerful by using the Lord of Blood's exaltation with the seppuku, but I never thought about that until now. Anyways, I mean, I mean that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can become a member on the channel if you want to. Uh, obviously, it's up to you. And I actually might stream a little bit more often. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get a schedule with that in. But for now, if you guys did enjoy this video, be sure to leave a like and to subscribe for more content like this. And I'll see you in the next video. Take care, everyone. And of course, stay safe.